Today, we are back at Motor Car Portfolio, located in Canton, Ohio, to take a look at this super cute Nash Metropolitan Series 1 convertible. But before we take the tour, if you're new to the channel, you've hit the jackpot. This channel, we feature cars off the beaten path, so to speak. Cars that often don't get the time of day. We feature classics, vintage, some exotics, lots of orphan cars. If that sounds like something that you'd be interested in, hit that subscribe button. Turn on all notifications by hitting the bell icon next to it so you never miss a video. We post between four and five videos a week. I just recently made a Facebook group called What It's Like. It will be in the uh, description to this video. I tried to put it in the description for the channel, but it won't let me edit that information on my iPad. So I'll have to see if it'll do that from a desktop. But we're going to grow a car community. So if you have any questions, comments, concerns, it will be on the Facebook group. A lot of people can interact with one another. If you want to show your memories, show what cars you had when you were growing up, show the cars you have now, we can talk and share information. It will be great. For those that don't know, I already reviewed a Nash Metropolitan. It was for, it was actually Metropolitan, Metropol a Rambler Metropolitan, sorry. It was a 57 model Series 3. In that episode, I said there's four series. We're going to hit them all. This is a Series 1 car. This is the most technically spec episode done to date, and I'm going to put all of the specs on the What It's Like Facebook group site if anyone has any ish or questions about what oil should be used and where. And that's how I think it's going to work going forward. Then that way it helps everybody in the car community out. Once again, they're baseline figures. Every site says something different, but we'll get to that when we get to that. I just wanted to show that this page exists for everybody that wants to show their memories, their stories, because YouTube, you can't show any pictures on here. And it's unfortunate. And I kind of wish that there was a community tab that people could show off what they have. It's nice to see what other people have and hear stories. I love hearing all the stories. Okay, anyway, getting to the featured car for today, 1954 Nash Metropolitan Convertible. Before talking about the Met, let's talk about the parent company, Nash. This is the 1954 Nash lineup. I would never give up a good opportunity to showcase some great ads. All of these Nashes were designed by Pinin Farina. They offered a small convertible, Super Country Club, Custom Country Club, Custom four-door, custom two-door wagon, they, as well as the cross-country wagon debuted for 1954. And Nash also offered the Metropolitan, which came in a hardtop or a convertible right out of the gate. So essentially, Nash offered two totally different convertibles, a small convertible offering and a tiny convertible offering. Nicknamed the Baby Nash, as you can see, it looks just like a Nash. I always thought that these cars were made in America and only the engine transmission running gear was made in England, but actually the whole car was made in England for the US market, which is very rare for a car company to do that from England. China, Japan, it's more heard of, but England, especially during this time, it's really uncommon to hear. This car was designed for the American market, but it was also sold as an Austin in foreign markets. The original name was never Metropolitan. The original name was actually NK1 Custom. I'm so happy they went with Metropolitan instead. It definitely fits this car's character better than the original name. Series 1 cars were built from 1953 to 1955, and we're only going to focus on the Series 1 cars today. The major difference between the Series 1 and two cars versus the series three and four cars is the engine size in the series one and two cars is smaller than the series three and four cars. The series one and two cars also have a fake hood scoop on the top of the hood, whereas the other two models don't. They're solid colors for series one and two, whereas they go to the two-tone color scheme on series three and four. Designed by William Flajoyle, the Metro rides a wheelbase of 85 inches. It is 149 and a half inches long, 61 and a half inches tall, 54 and a half inches wide. The convertible weighs 1,785 pounds, and it actually weighs less than the hardtop. The hardtop weighs 1,890 pounds. Production numbers, uh, total Nash production numbers for 1954 was 91,121 units, of which... 11,198 were Metropolitans. The Metropolitan started at 
$1,445, which would be equivalent to you going down and spending $15,530.20 in 2022. Both of the Nash Metros are a steel unibody construction. Features the standard equipment that came with the Nash Metro, turn signals, electric operated dual windshield wipers, cigarette lighter, dual sun visors, foam rubber front seat cushion, genuine leather and nylon upholstered front seat back and cushion, vinyl plastic door trim, side panel and rear seat upholstery, Continental rear kit mounted spare tire as well as a spare tire cover. The optional equipment, weather eye, conditioned air system, custom radio, wide white wall tires, and partial flow oil filter. The engine that is powering the Nash Metropolitan is an inline overhead valve Austin B series engine, 73 cubic inch displacement. It's rated at 1200 cc's, but the actual cubic inch Displacement is 1197, 42 horsepower, 62 foot-pounds of torque, has 7.2 to 1 compression, two valves per cylinder, 65.5 millimeter bore with a 89 millimeter stroke, has three main bearings. Later on, they go to five main bearings, but for the earlier engines, it's three main bearings. These are baseline numbers running temperature the average running temperature of this engine is between 180 and 200 degrees is where it performs the best what oil does it take from an mg form it said 20 w50 from a nash metro repair form said any rebuilt engine use 10 w30 or 10 w40 so that information is a little bit mistrewn that's what i mean like every single site you go to you're going to get something different so i put both of them there it's just the baseline oil pressure 80 psi when starting is normal it should run between 50 and 60 psi as you're driving down the road the engine was constructed with a one-piece crankcase as well as a one-piece cylinder block and the cylinder heads all of which are cast from cast iron Transmission used in the Nash Metropolitan is actually the same exact transmission that's used in the Austin A40. It is a four-speed unit with first gear blocked off, so it makes it a three-speed synchro mesh column shift unit. It uses straight weight 30 oil. Manual says two and a quarter quarts, but it's actually closer to two and a half quarts. That's what Metropolitan Parts says. All Nash Metropolitans use a 12-volt electrical system. Now, I've seen some with positive ground, so that's why I wasn't going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. In the comments section below, if it's a positive ground system or a negative ground system. Rear end gear ratio. So I've seen mixed information about this. The MG site said that it uses a 422 in all the early cars with a serial number E21008. And then they use a 390 later on to give it a better top speed. Also quit the engine from whining around town. I've also seen the other rear end gear called 4625 to 1. Takes conventional 80 slash 90 gear oil. It takes about three quarters of a quart. The steering box also takes 80 to 90 gear oil, about 12 ounces in the steering box. Suspension. The front suspension was an Airflex front suspension coil springs at the front and at the rear used semi-elliptical rear springs, Hotchkiss type power drive. Tires. When it left the factory, it had 5.20 by 13 four ply bias tires. The fuel tank holds 10 and a half gallons. The cooling system with the heater holds 7.5 quarts. I've seen it in between 7.5 quarts and eight quarts. Reviews. Let's talk about what car reviewers back in the day called this car. Car Life called the Met. It was also called the Met for short instead of Metro because International had this wagon called the Metro. So they couldn't use that name because of legal reasons. So they just called it the Met for short. Anyway, Car Life called the Met a big car in miniature, saying it was a fun car to drive, perfect for a second family car. Road and track, the Met handled like a full-size stock American car. It had its share of wallow in the corners, and there is a little bit of that seat of your pants feeling when the rear end takes a little bit of time getting back in line. Motor Trends, Walt Walron spent 1,700 miles in a Met, and he was blown away. He was totally fascinated by the way that it drove, saying that it's not a sports car, but 
it handled going into the corners and it would only break away from you if you were under full power. George Mason, president of Nash Motors, he took two Metropolitans to Raleigh Speedway in North Carolina, which I think this footage is from that, for a test. First car did a 24 hours endurance race and they averaged about 61 miles per hour during the whole time they did that endurance race. They did a total of 1,467 miles without it needing a tune-up, as in the engine needing a tune-up. The second car did a 24-hour economy run, and it averaged 41.7 miles to the gallon. Just wanted to show you this door panel. It's totally different than the other Metro that we did earlier. It's got nice chrome trim, door handle, window crank. Okay, moving on to the dashboard, all the buttons, switches, and knobs. This is very European. Nothing is labeled. Correction, next to nothing is labeled. Starting from the left to the right, choke. The heater control knob is very unique in the sense that you can pull it out and select either defrost or the floor as well as turn it for the fan speed. Wipers is right to the right of that and I'm pretty sure it's a two-speed wiper setup but if I'm wrong in the comment section below. Moving on to the steering wheel, notice the switch at the top of the steering wheel. That is actually your turn signal indicator. It is very unique. Moving past the steering wheel, there is a single gauge cluster. Inside that gauge cluster sits the speedometer, the fuel gauge is at the bottom, and in the center is the odometer. Okay, moving on to the gear selector. It's a column shift three on the tree unit. Every single Metro came with a manual transmission shifted this way. Moving to the key switch, this key switch is very interesting. So you move it to the on position. To the left of the key switch, there is a lever. You pull the lever and that's how you start it. You have to have the clutch depressed, of course. Don't have to, but it would be safe. There's also a knob around the cylinder and those are the lights. Very interesting setup. Coming back to the center, there's two knobs. Those are for your radio controls. In the center, it looks like that is a heater vent, but that's actually the speaker vent. And then there's a cigarette lighter at the bottom there. Moving to the top of the dashboard, that's where the ashtray is found. This is your glove box situation. It literally is like a glove box. You can't really fit too much in there, but it is space that it takes up. It, it, it is surprisingly big for what it is. Inside the Nash Metro. Nash Metropolitan. So if you're tall, I'd suggest putting this putting right leg in first. <laughs> I lied. This is a little bit trickier because the steering wheel is so big and you have long legs in the seating position. So if you have long legs, I'd suggest backing up, putting your butt on the seat. and then just kind of turning in here. As you turn it in, as you're turning, if I can only talk, as you're turning in, you go just like that. But just check out how that hood looks. I honestly think the first generation and the second generation are the best generations because you have that nice hood scoop over top of the hood. It looks very Thunderbird-esque. And I kid you not, there is more room in this car then in a Thunderbird, 55, 56, 57 Thunderbird. Ashtray up top here. So this is how much space I have. The steering wheel does not sit in my crotch. This is how much headroom I got. I got there's lots of room in this car, despite how small it is. This one has sunshades. This one's a convertible, so you would unlatch it here and here. It's not a power top, you'd just slide it back. Go to the back seat here. Notice these are actually the wheel wells. They act as armrests. That is the access to the trunk area. There is no outside access to the trunk. You have to get through the trunk through the back of the back seat. The window and the convertible top it's plexiglass I want to show you something real quick anybody that can answer this question in the comment section 
this hole, this window, looks very similar to another car. It's in the future, and it's it's bigger. It's more exaggerated. I'll give you a hint. It's a GM car in the 2000s. In the comments section below if you know what it is. Okay, getting under the hood. We didn't get under the hood of the last one, but getting under the hood, there's a lever inside here. I don't know if you can see it. It's down inside here. And that pops it, and then there's a secondary latch right here. Just check out that engine. It's all, every time I see it, it's so small. It's got a nice aftermarket air cleaner on it. Tractor engine's bigger than that. But just look at the engine bay. You can stick it. You you could stick a bigger engine in there, no issue. If you wanted to. Hood scoop is not functional. I always thought that they were. You can also tell that from here. So there's the hood scoop and it's totally not functional. Just listen to how this closes. On to the pros and cons. But before we talk about the pros and cons, one more tidbit. I heard from inside the comment section below the last Metropolitan that we did that the doors are reversible. You could use the right door on the left side or the left door on the right side. In the comment section below, I think that's the coolest feature of any car ever. Yes. When you put the mirrors on and the door handles on, you'll have to fill those holes in. But it's cool to know that you could use either side door for either side. Okay, on to the pros. Low buck collectible still makes sense for around town use. A certain charm gets really good gas mileage. Against it, rust easily. Unreliable Austin engine. Dumpy styling. That's what that said. Now, I've heard mixed reviews. A lot of people said, why, the Austin engine is what the English, what the Brits put in everything. And then I've heard other people say that they are unreliable. But I've heard that the electrical system is the prince of darkness. That is what gives everybody more problems than anything else about these cars. In the comments section, your experiences. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. And, and as always, um, if you can, please like, share, and subscribe to the channel if you dig the content. And until next time, toodaloo!